Welcome to Alpha Centurion. I'll be your guide. So today we're going to be looking at chapter six of justification of the Council of Trent. Now, I know that these videos have slowed down to a crawl on my progression, but understand I'm only doing so so that way these videos are not overly long like some of my videos in the past have been. So on divine grace, what we're looking at is the idea from the Council of Trent that humankind, that man, which here is going to represent humankind, is aided by divine grace in receiving faith. Okay, so this is going to bleed into the idea of predestination. So if we look at Romans 10, chapter 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. This means that anything, not just in the realms of religion and theology, that you hear, if you choose to believe it, you must take it on faith, as you were not directly there to witness the veracity of what you learn. This does not uh, negate investigation. This, pre this is a preamble that when you first hear something, if you choose to believe it, that belief, that trust is faith. And we're going to get into that. Because this faith that we're speaking of is to turn Fear to hope, but only after you realize sin, that is. Sin is the sickness. Hope is the treatment. Faith is the administration of that treatment. So thus, faith equals trust. Love of God equals justice. And remember, this is me pulling from Trent's explanation of divine grace. The action here is the move against sin, being equivalent to baptism. Baptism being an inoculation in this drawn out metaphor. Let's look at Hebrews 11.6 for proof of this. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Him being Hashem. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, and that he rewards those who seek him. Then if we look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, and at Mark chapter 2, verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Then let's look at Sirach. And I realize that Sirach is also called Echelestius, but I really can't pronounce that. So let's look at Sirach chapter 1, verse 7. Fear of the Lord is wisdom and instruction, and fidelity and meekness are his delight. Fidelity, loyalty, and meekness, humility, are humbleness. So when we're looking at this predisposition, the predisposition here for grace is going to be Loyalty, fidelity, piety, and meekness, humility. Divine grace is a free gift from God. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't predispose one to receive divine grace. Get it? And since we have enough time, let's see if we can jump into the next one, chapter 7. On the voluntary reception of grace. Because it being predisposed or being predestined, doesn't mean that it denies free will. So, meritous cause is to Jesus Christ alone, by the will of God the Father. He makes us just, given each according to his own measure, which the Holy Spirit distributes as he wills, based on disposition and cooperation. So where do we see this idea of disposition and cooperation? So let's look at Romans 5, verse 1 through 5. We have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into his grace 
in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Mind you, I'm using all these quotes uh, of the Bible through the ESV translation, just because I know more Protestants are more open to the ESV than the NAV, uh, or my personal favorite translation, the NRSV. Okay. So here it is appropriate to speak of the Christian virtues, faith, hope, and charity. As faith alone cannot attain perfect union without the other two gifts, for even the demons believed and were afraid. And we're going to look here at James chapter 2, verse 17 through 20 for proof of this claim. So also faith alone without works is dead. But some of you will say, you have faith and I have works. So show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Or as my preferred translation says, even the demons believe and are afraid. Now let's look at Matthew chapter 19, verse 17. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. I.e., there's a work involved. Now let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. And then Galatians 6, verse 15. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And you know what? I think we have time to get into chapter 8. Just to finish off these thoughts. Works do not merit grace. So I don't want you to get confused on what I'm saying here. While I'm saying good works are necessary. Fruits to express. They are not necessary to attain a state of grace. And they are not a state of grace. And they are not equivalent to a state of grace. Being good and doing good are two different things. And being accepted by God is different than doing the works of God. So let's look at this here. According to the Council of Trent, works cannot merit faith, and faith cannot merit grace. Therefore, works do not merit grace. Grace is freely given by God. Let me say that again. Works cannot merit faith. Faith cannot merit grace. Therefore, works do not merit grace. Grace is freely given by God. And for proof of this, we're going to look at Romans chapter 11, verse 6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. There is not an apparent contradiction, as some atheist or anti-theist might see in comparing these chapters and these books that we just compared. At the same time, there is not this kind of Catholic works versus Protestant solo gracia, or grace alone, nor a conflict with the Protestant view of solo fide happening here either. There's not a conflict there, okay? This is saying that it is through God's gift, through his gift, that you are predisposed, and through his gift that you are chosen, so you're doing no work. So it is through faith and baptism that you are brought in to the church. But that does not mean that you worked for it or that you earned it. It is a freely given gift. God can forgive anyone. God can allow anyone into his kingdom that he so chooses. We don't have the right to say someone is or isn't in his kingdom because that is God's kingdom. I just wanted to make that clear. I hope this was a helpful video. 
I hope you enjoyed this. Tell me if you like this background. I'm gonna try some different places out now that my new camera is in and it actually has a way not to overheat. Uh, and peace, like, and subscribe. We'll go on to the next chapter, uh, chapter nine, uh, that no one should boast in the next video. Have a good night.